What time is it? It's Patchwork Staycation time. Well, hello to all you fiend sewers. You guys are doing a fabulous job. And I did post a little bit earlier, if you saw on our Facebook page, there's that see all the photos. And that is such a helpful thing to be able to just see everyone's block at one time without having to scan through all the posts. Um, also, at this time, we are so excited to have as many subscribers as we've got on our YouTube page. So as you're looking at this, we'd sure love it even if you just drifted by and thought you were going to Tractor Supply or something and you found Patchwork that you just like and subscribe and who knows if we get enough people, I think we get a fruit basket or something. Now, I've not seen as many posts on this third block, but I know you folks are busy, but it does look like we're seeing some relief in some parts of the country. So we're going to move on and today, we're gonna to work on two blocks. You, you folks have done such a great job that I'm gonna give you two blocks because most of it is techniques you've already done. So the two blocks we'll be working on today will be Yankee Pride, which in your book is on page five, and Kansas Trouble, which in your book is on page 10. Now, we, we're gonna have a lot of free stuff for you, but obviously we have other product that we'd like for you to know about. So I'm going to reference things from time to time. We're gonna hang some of those quilts. Uh, you can merely look at it. Everything we tell you is optional. And on some of these free patterns, and you're going to get another free, a free pattern today, it's optional whether you put it in your quilt or not. You might make a placemat out of it or a pillow or something. It's just activity to keep you using the techniques you are learning and how you apply it and whether you put it in your quilt or not is going to be strictly up to you. So today, Yankee Pride block is also often referred to as the Stonewall Jackson block or Jackson Star in your free handouts, you're going to get a little bit of information about Stonewall Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, not Stonewell Jackson, and you're also going to get another Civil War crossword puzzle. Now, I still don't know, uh, either you're afraid to ask me an answer or you haven't gotten to it, but I, on the puzzle that you're getting in this handout, I will tell you many of the answers are going to live in that Civil War timeline that you got on the first session. So if you go back and kind of read through that, if it's an answer you can't get, and, and these are really intended. If you have teenagers or children at home and they want to play with it, that's fine. Whether you download it or not is going to be strictly up to you. I decided to talk about Carrie Nation, and when I added that, it brought up the temperance movement. So you will have a handout about the the temperance movement and the WCTU, you're going to get the T block, which is the quilt that's kind of over my shoulder and to my right. And one fun thing about the Carrie Nation block, it's the large quilt that's behind me. And it's one of those that is nothing but squares. And I'm telling you, I, I've made one of these blocks actually for my 30s quilt. And I've also made the little miniature, so the little there's a little tiny one back there that is half the size of the block that lives in the quilt. One of the things that I loved about doing the research on Carrie Nation is when Carrie Nation was born, she was C-A-R-R-I-E, and she changed the spelling of her name to C-A-R-R-Y, as in she carried the nation. And for those of you who don't know the history, you might want to look up and read a little bit about Carrie Nation because she was married to an alcoholic, was uh, severely abused, and consequently, she's the one who's known for picking up a hatchet and going around and chopping up saloons. So you will have your, your tea block, and it will be done in AccuQuilt, traditional and ruler method, so you can approach it in any of those manners, and a little bit of history. So we want you to be real smart when this is all said and done. Now you see on the table in front of me, 
the two blocks that we'll be working on today, and I'm sharing them, I'm sharing the black ones, and I've done these in all colors, but I'll share those in a bit. And I'll show you um, my other colorways, but what I want, want you to see is right here is my Yankee Pride, and then the one to the left is the Kansas Trouble. And I decided to add the Kansas Trouble after I got this first one done because it's all half square triangles. I have sashed this one now. It's at its 12 and a half as this one is. But because I did these little uh, points red, when I put this red sashing on, do you see how I sort of lost that corner triangle right there? I'm not so sure it's gonna bother me enough that I'm gonna take this out, but I'm real close to thinking when I hung it on the wall, well, drats, I should know better than that. And so I am likely to pull this off, and if I still wanted to use this, I would use a skinny sashing first so that I didn't lose all the work on these points, and then I would come back with the red. Now, as we look at this block, you can see flying geese, On the, these are referred to as flying geese as it comes around. Now in your pattern, if you look at illustration three, illustration 3A and 3B, now I'm pretty much done. I know some of you are still waiting for your book, but I'm going to assume that you're working out of the book because I can't cover all of this otherwise. The book is written for doing these in a connector method. Now, any of you who have been in patchwork very long probably know the name Mary Ellen Hopkins. And Mary Ellen was a dear friend of mine. I worked with her for years. Holy mackerel. I, I could write 10 books about our life from one side of the continent to the next. Mary Ellen is known for having developed the connector method. And that is where you take a rectangle, as it shows you in illustration 3A, it tells you to take a rectangle, take a square and put on it, sew through, fold back, do the same thing on the other side. And so with two squares and one rectangle, you make a flying geese unit. I'm going to show you how to convert that traditionally before I would do connectors today. Even though Mary Ellen is, was a hoot and a half to be around and a brilliant person on how to break down patchwork blocks, I do feel like it's tough to do connectors and stay very clean on all of them. So I would probably still do the seven eights and make my flying geese that way before I would do connectors, but I still use them. On Yankee Pride, your A is, the, is just a regular square. Your B is where it's connector squares that I would be doing as half square triangles. Your C would be a quarter square triangle, and your D would be the same square. If you are going to do the Yankee Pride as a AccuQuilt, your A is die six, your B is die five, your C is die eight, and your D is die two. That is using the six inch cube. Now, if you're using your eight inch cube, you still would use those same dies. You're just going to have a block that is larger or a 10 even larger yet. And certainly when, when these are all done, you're going to be able to incorporate them. Uh, but for me, I'm going to take the C and I'm going to cut a two inch strip and use quarter square triangles in lieu of the rectangle, and for B, I'm going to do two inch strips and I'm going to do half square triangles. So that's as much as I'm gonna cover about the sizes and everything. I do hope you're taking the time as you look at these patterns to read the other information that's on the page. There's a little bit of some poetry, some just some history as you look at that. Now let's take a look at our Kansas Trouble block, which is on uh, page 10. There's one correction I want to be sure that you make on this one. You see that as you read your pieces, it says A, D, C, D, E. Well, obviously that D should be a B. So it's A, B, C, D, E. If you are using AccuQuilt on Kansas Trouble, if you own a 10 inch cube, 
A is number three die and D is number five die. That is the only units that you can use from that 10 inch cube that gets you this exact same block. But again, you know that you have choices in how you do it. Now, if you take a look at the blue one, the red one is sewn, the blue one I am currently working on, obviously, and all I did was join, there's four units exactly alike, and take a look at this. They're all half square triangles. Oops, sorry. They're all half square triangles. So I would sew two sets of lights and darks and put a dark triangle on it, and that's that piece. Then I would do the same thing here, but one of these sets has got to have a square on it. So I typically sew exactly like you're looking at it, and I sew one, two, three, four light and darks together, pair of two, put the third one on, add that, bingo. Then I would sew this to this and this to this. That then would give me all four of the elements that I need for this. These are rotated. If you look at your large half square triangle, they rotate so it goes this way, turns one to the right, turns one to the right, turns one to the right. I make four of these. So when I'm sewing, here's what mine looks like. I have a stack of four. Then when I get those four completed, I put them in pairs running east, west, or north, south. It doesn't really matter. But I want you to also take a look at the back of this. I want to be sure that I keep all the weight from these little triangles going toward that one, and then all of that weight's going to go here. But when you join, when you join these together here, you're going to end up having to take a little bit of precaution in here and if you feel like you need to don't be afraid to press that seam open I don't think I need to but again that's personal but I do like how flat that lays now I want to show you my 30s one because what I ended up with here is a, a smaller block so if you take a look at your Kansas trouble when you're all finished, you have to sash it to get it to 12. If you don't sash it, this is one that you can square off just like your 214, the 14-inch block with the basket is squared off. I'm going to put this in my 30s quilt in place of that 14-inch basket. So I still did it exactly like the, the two previous blocks I showed you, but I decided to frame it. So those are the three colorways of your Kansas Troubles. Now, while I'm on the 30s, I wanted to show you my Carrie Nation 30s block. I just decided that I wanted it to fit in. Now, at this point, it's 12, so obviously I can't make it 14, and I'm going to leave it as a 12-inch block, but I love the movement that you get from this, and while we're looking at this, and I mentioned Mary Ellen Hopkins, I've also done a pattern for Mary Ellen. It's called Ode to Mary Ellen, and it's all connectors. So for those of you who love connectors, you might get a kick out of that pattern. This is what Mary Ellen notoriously called a two-bell block. I'm telling you it would be worth if you had, had had the luxury of seeing her present this. She would say, two-bell, ding, ding. <laughs> Do that silly stuff. And I mean, we loved it. But what she meant when she would refer to a two-bell block is when the corners of the blocks are different. Like these, the corner of this one, they're both squares, so it won't do it. The corners of this one is a large square and a four patch. Now, if you take a look at this quilt behind me now, see how you get a secondary design? You have X's and O's. That tells me that as you rotate this, where these little, these little four patches come together creates one look, and where the large one comes together creates another look. That is what, from this point 
on, I have always referred to these as two bell blocks because of what Mary Ellen taught me about how to look at a block. This tells me if I set this block to itself, I'm gonna get a dynamite quilt because I'm gonna get a quilt that has different movement than if I set one's corners are the same, it will not do what a two bell block will do. So that's kind of a little bit of a tip for you to start looking for blocks that do have opposite corner. Oh, and their corners are not the same, all four. So it's two and two is the way the corners would be done that will yield you a secondary design with no work. It's just rotating the block. I wanted to show you the T-quilt, which is one of your free patterns. And the T-quilt, because it's, of course, for the temperance uh, movement. And I ended up, this is a nine inch block. I framed it to a 10 and then I turned it on point. Now it's my 14 because in my black quilt, I am not going to use the basket either. I've kind of thought through because I'm making three, the blue one's going to look just like the quilt in the book, but the other two are not. So I wanted you to see as you look through the book, if you go, oh, I don't want to do that hand applique thing. I don't want to do that. Or I don't want to do that basket. This T quilt is a perfect one for you to do and frame it and then put your, your corners on. Now you could put your corners on first and then frame to get it to 14 because it's got to be at 14 and a half at that point. So I've sewn a couple of things because the Yankee Pride has a little bit more piecing work and you've not done uh, this little square in a square or it's often referred to as an economy block and that's this little fellow right here. And that is a tricky one that in the past I would have sewn this as a connector. And that's what your pattern is telling you as you look at it. It's telling you to cut this center square, the entire width of that, and then putting four squares on following that little diagram that's in 3A and, and how you sew your connectors on. I'm telling you, this is the one that perplexes the entire quilting community about how do I know what size that square is and wh that's why I do a connector, because I don't know how to do that math. And now I know there's a math teacher out there that already knows all these complicated pi r squared times the whatever to the who nanny and all that stuff. I know how to do it. I just don't want to do it. So I have learned the simplest thing in the world. I can do any size in the world here. Well, I guess as long as it's not as big as my house, I could do it. If I know that this whole unit is going to be four when it's finished, I know that corner's two. I have to know this, because two and two is four. The secret, this is often going to be eighths or even sixteenths, but the secret is just simply what is the diagonal of a two-inch square. If you own a square ruler... All you're going to do is come down to the diagonal of two. I'm going to pick up another ruler. Now, I'm not trying to have you see the numbers. I'm just showing you the, the motion. Here's the diagonal of two because there's one and there's two. I need to know how long that line is, and that's what size that guy is. He is the diagonal of the square you're after. So in other words, if you make up your mind that you want a six inch square, we know that one corner is three. Pick up one of your square rulers, go to the diagonal of three, lay a rectangle ruler on it, and take that measurement. That's how big that square is. Now, obviously, I've got to add a seam allowance to whatever that square is. So if I do the diagonal of three and I measure it, plus a half an inch. That's three plus a half an inch. Even though I don't do connectors, I cut the base rectangle just like your pattern tells you. And then it would tell you to lay a square and then you would sew through the middle of that square and you would fold it back and it would look like that. And this is 3A. 
Then I would pick up another square and lay it there, and I would sew across, and there would be my flying geese unit. I've sewn them this way, or I sewed them this way for many, many years. I just found that to get those always clean was not easy. I now sew them. If you have AccuQuilt, this is a slam dunk easy sew. I use the good measure rulers, and I can do it with the half square triangle and a quarter square triangle. Um, those are the two elements I'm gonna sew for you. So let's sew those. It doesn't matter how many of these square in a square and or economy blocks I sew, I am forever doing it this way. I want to find the center of this square. So I have found it's easier just to pick that square up and crease it. And see, by just gently creasing this, even if you didn't have nails, you can actually crease that. And that gives me a center line. Let me show you on the back side. See that center line? That tells me that that's where I'm going to pick up one of my little half square triangles. And that point right there has got to sit in that valley. So when I do that, the only thing I do, and I don't care now whether it's flat or tip, what I do is just make sure that's aligned and I'm ready to go to the sewing machine. So you, you notice now that I make sure my needle's in the down position, my stiletto's my second hand, so I'm out of the way of the camera, and I'm gonna take a stitch, and then I'm gonna, see how I'm aligned? Now I'm just gonna sew through that. And you know I like to keep something in my machine. Now, when I sew a flying geese unit, we always have the one quarter square, which is referred to as the goose. And then we have the two half squares that sit on either side, which are often referred to as the wings of the goose and or the sky that the goose flies through. I tell you, if I sew a hundred thousand of these, I sew them exactly the same way every time. I think it's a good habit, regardless of right or left-handed, that when you lay the geese down to sew them, if you need four for this block or eight, stack all of the quarter square triangles on top of each other and stack the set of half squares, regardless of whether you've cut them traditional, AccuCut, or ruler, the assembly method is, is clear. So the first thing that I do is I put the goose in my hand and he is flying right. His nose is right. My language is I always put the top one on first. Now people go, well, how do I know that's the top? Well, folks, if he's flying right, that's the top. Now, if he was flying left, that wouldn't be the case. And then the only thing that I do is lay this down like that. But while you're close on the camera, I explain this as, as if this were a clock. I start sewing at 12 o'clock and I'm going to sew down to three o'clock. Then I'll come out of the machine and I will put the other wing on and I will start back at three o'clock and come to six o'clock. So I'm sewing in a clockwise motion the goose is always on the bottom. The wing or sky is always on top. That's how I keep that nose clean. So let's take this first unit to the machine. Now I know there's plenty of you going, well, why don't you just cut that thread and take that out? I could, I've already told you folks, this is habit with me. And even if this is what I always do, typically I'm sitting a little tighter in on my machine. Now I'm gonna fold this back and then I'm going to pick up, now I have to pick up the opposite color. So we, if I put a red one on first, I gotta put a black one on because I want those two red ones sitting side by side. So I'm gonna pick up a black one and if you see that little crease right there in the center, my point on that quarter, on that half square triangle, I don't give a hoot about this outside right now, I just care that I am in the smack center 
Now I'm going to cut my goose. Now, if you were sewing all four or eight of your flying geese, you wouldn't be in and out of the machine as much as I am just for demo. I take that wing back. See how nice that is? Now I'm going to pick up, so I've sewn from 12 to three. I'm now going to pick up the wing and sew from three to six. Now here's a little tip for you. If you cut these with rulers, you will always have a little tiny nub hanging out. You are not incorrect. If you had cut these with AccuQuilt, that will be blunted off. If you had cut it with traditional, you will still have a point. So now let's go to the machine and see how nice that sits with me doing nothing but finger pressing. I'm gonna use my lift to go into my machine. I'm gonna try to stay out of the way so you folks can see this. And now I'm going to come back and pick up my square and a square. See how nice that sits. Now I have a choice to decide which next which color I'm going to put on. But the other thing that I want to do is it's easier, I think, if you do this. See how I just put the wrong sides of that together? See how my points are right here? That tells me that I've kept both of those in the center, and then I just creased that, open this back up, and right now, it doesn't make any difference if I put the red one on or the black one on, I'd be correct. So I'm just going to pick the, the red one up, and see how that tip hits that crease? I'm telling you that this is the slickest way. Now this is off a smidgen. Part of that is me sewing in this awkward motion, but let's take it to the machine. Before I do anything, I clean that nose up, ear, nose, point. I get that one off. And I get that one off. Now, I've not ironed or anything. And there's my flying geese. I always have the goose flat. And the seam allowances always go away. They go to the wing. Don't ever do this on a standard goose. Now, if you were sewing two together, you might run across a time where you would need to flip that, but that's what I want the back side to look like, and that's what I want the front side to look like. Now, the third one's on. I'm just going to crease. Now, I don't even have to crease this back. I just like to. And now my last one goes on, and typically, by the time you get to the last one, after you sew a few of these, you'll see... See how nice that sits right there? And there's my valley with my quarter inch. I still like to do this because it gives me a clean unit. Now I'm going to get off all this mess. And I'm pretty good about cleaning these up. And like I said, that one was off and I could tell because when I went into the machine, I, with my arms trying to stay out of the way, there is my square in a square with my quarter inch intact. And if you take a look at the back, I like it just like the goose. That center square should remain flat. And the points, the seam gets taken to the points. And I do that regardless of light, medium, or dark. Now, I didn't sew this rectangle, but I do want to address it because there's a um, one rectangle of my black and then two squares. And if you look at how they live in the quilt, I'm going to move this so you see this one is laying this way. It wouldn't make any difference when you rotated it, but when I look at these, I want my rectangles in order. In other words, I sew two one way and two the other way so that I keep the rectangle oriented. Now, like if I turn this block this way, these are all for my rectangles, my light squares on the inside and my dark squares on the outside. 
You could just turn these and rotate them as you go around, but it depends on your fabric. If that fabric is something that the direction makes a big change, you may or may not like it, and it could be a surprise. So I sew it the way it lives in the drawing. So if you study the drawing and you assemble that direction, that's the way that I sew it. So when I lay these down, the points right here are the red, actually like the flying geese unit. Eons ago, we would have seen this done with a seam in here, most likely, and two flying geese put together. But we eliminate that seam, so in essence, it's like a flying geese unit, but what we're doing is simplifying it and dumping one seam. So while I have eight flying geese that run around the outside parameter of the block, I actually, my red star is made up of economy blocks, not flying geese. So it's a little bit of a fooler. So if you look at this and your block diagram in your book clearly lays out how you sew in rows. And I encourage you to keep this in mind. So I'm sewing this to this. So I'm going to have a skinny row, a wide row, a wide row, a wide row, and a skinny row. This is my blue Yankee Pride, and you might want some sunglasses. This is my 30s, and I, I'm in love with 1930s fabrics anyhow, and it's a little mushy on that star, but I'm telling you, I am having a great time working with these. I want you to take one more quick look at how I created two 14 inch blocks from, this was a nine that I sashed to a 10 and framed to a 14. This is a 10 that I framed to a 14. Now I could have left them both. I could have taken my T block and framed it out to a 12 and replaced a 12. And here's the other thing. I've had a couple of people, um, message me and say, what if I wanted this quilt larger? Well, that's the key with this. With these extra blocks, if you kind of play around with these, you could end up making your quilt larger. And I see some of you are already choosing a second quilt and a third quilt. And that's the reason I decided to do two blocks this time, because I do want to try to get us caught up on all the techniques. And then we'll start addressing the setting. I know some of you are working ahead with your filler strips, as I am. And I'll share a little bit more of that with you next Sunday. But in the meantime, stay safe. I think the world has extra toilet paper now. I think we're going to be fine. Um, we're still in that point that we need to be safe and, and take the precautions that, that the government's encouraging us to do. So... Post on staycation, let me see what you're up to, say howdy, and stay safe. We'll see you next Sunday.